this is Duke University. Hi, I'm Leslie Marks. I'm the William and Sue Gross Research Fellow and Professor of Economics here at Fuqua. And you may have had me as your instructor in managerial economics or environmental economics. This Fuqua faculty conversation will address some of the topics in the economics of collusion. I have a new book that was recently published by MIT Press on the economics of collusion, cartels, and bidding rings. That's a resource you can turn to for additional information on the topic. I want you to think back to your managerial economics class and the discussion there of oligopoly markets. Recall that an oligopoly is a market in which only a few firms compete with one another and entry by new firms is impeded. The level of profits for the firms in an oligopoly depends in part on the nature of competition among the firms and the extent of rivalry among the firms. Firms in an oligopoly will sometimes attempt to suppress rivalry through illegal collusion. A cartel is a group of firms that suppress rivalry among themselves, coordinating prices and output levels to increase their joint profits. In your managerial economics class, you may have done an in-class exercise modeled on the OPEC cartel. In that exercise, the student teams acted as oil producing countries. In each round, the teams would choose the quantity of oil to produce. The greater was the total amount of oil produced by all the teams, the lower was the associated market price. The student teams could increase their profits by agreeing to suppress rivalry and reduce the amount of oil that they produced. If each team reduced its output, the price could be elevated to the level of the monopoly price. That's where the total profit of all the teams would be maximized. If you did this exercise in class, you'll remember that getting cooperation among all the teams was difficult. Why? If the other teams reduced their output, causing the price to increase, then an individual team had a strong incentive to cheat and increase its output to the maximum. This incentive for cheating, or secret price cutting, has been identified in the economics literature as the key hurdle that cartels face in trying to secure profits above the competitive level. Nobel Prize winning economist George Stigler wrote about the incentive for secret deviation by cartel members in an important 1964 paper. He noted that successful collusion, in addition to being illegal, can be difficult for firms to achieve even if they are willing to break the law because of the strong incentives for secret deviations. However, he noted that it's possible for firms to put in place structures that allow successful collusion. Specifically, he talked about how cartels need three types of structures, pricing structures, allocation structures, and enforcement structures. Just briefly, Pricing structures are the mechanisms by which colluding firms elevate prices or restrict output, which of course naturally leads to an increase in price. Allocation structures allow the cartel firms to divide up the collusive gain among them and correct any deviations from that agreement as they go along. Enforcement structures establish the monitoring needed to detect secret deviations and establish a threat of punishment should secret deviations be detected. In this conversation, I would like to focus on the pricing structures used in a particular cartel, namely the vitamins cartel. This is a case that I worked on as a consulting expert, and it has a number of very interesting features. An easy place to go on the internet if you want to see information about recent cartels is the European Commission website. There you can see the European Commission decisions for cartel cases going back to 2001. The EC has dealt with cartels in a wide variety of products, including a large number of chemicals, a number of paper products, industrial products such as copper plumbing tubes, steel beams, and industrial thread, and homier products such as bathroom fittings, 
beer, tobacco, and laundry detergent. For today, I'm going to focus on the vitamins cartel. The firms involved were Hoffman LaRoche, BASF, Aventis, Lanza, Solve, Merck, Daiichi, Isai, Congo, Sumitomo, Sumika, Takeda, and Tanabe. These firms produced a variety of vitamins and were found by the EC to have illegally fixed prices for these products, including setting up a machinery to monitor and enforce adherence to their agreements and participating in a structure of regular meetings to implement their plans. The duration of the conspiracies differed across the vitamins, but roughly extended through the 1990s. Within each vitamin, such as vitamin A, there are a variety of individual vitamin products, some of different strengths and some intended for human consumption and others intended for livestock. This is the price plot of a particular vitamin A product, vitamin A acetate 650 feed grade. Let's look at this graph in some detail. You can see on the right hand side are the names of the manufacturers. The manufacturers included in the cartel were Roche, BASF, and Rhone Polonc. Conspiracy era sales were something over $300 million. Uh, and you see on the horizontal axis, years. And on the vertical axis, prices of the vitamin product in dollars per kilogram. You also see that some of the area is shaded. There's an area that's indicated as the plea era period uh, through most of the 1990s. Those are the years that the cartel members pled guilty to having fixed the prices. And you can see that the shading also extends back to 1985, where there was alleged conspiratorial behavior going back to 1985. On the graph, you also see a line. That's the price line. That's the price of this vitamin product. Uh, and you can see, as the price moves through time, dramatic increases in the price in 1985, and then again at the beginning of the plea era period. The price levels off for a little while and then comes back down dramatically as the competition authorities began their investigation into the behavior of the cartel. There are other lines on this graph indicating economists' estimates of what the price would have been in the absence of the conspiracy. This is often referred to as the but-for price what the price would have been but for the conspiracy. And so you can see in comparing the actual price with the but for price, the dramatic increase in price that was achieved through the collusive efforts of these firms. When a cartel does something as dramatic as the price increases engineered by the vitamins cartel, they have to be very careful about the way in which they implement those price increases. If they move too fast or push prices too high, they can get significant resistance to the price increases from buyers, and that can be destabilizing to the cartel. Cartels must design their pricing structures to deal with buyer resistance. What are some things a cartel might do to reduce resistance by buyers to the collusive price increases? They could increase prices in small steps. They could coordinate justifications for price increases. They could make price announcements. In particular, they could make public price announcements, coordinating so they're all announcing the same price increases. That would help buyers feel comfortable that they are not being singled out for a price increase and so not being going to be disadvantaged relative to their competitors. The cartels might agree on leaders and followers, timing of the price announcements, and the lead time before effective dates. In fact, in vitamins, they even implemented their price announcements with an eye towards disguising the cartel behavior as normal oligopolistic behavior. According to the European Commission decision, the parties normally agreed that one producer should first announce the increase, either in a trade journal or in direct communication with major customers. Once the price increase was announced by one cartel member, the others would generally follow suit. In this way, the concerted price increases could be passed off if challenged as the result of price leadership in an oligopolistic market. These are all things that were done in the vitamins cartel, and we're going to be able to see these pricing structures showing up in the data. This figure is very similar 
to the previous one. In fact, the price line here is the same as the price line in the previous figure, although it looks slightly different because the scale on the horizontal axis is different. This graph extends back uh, into the 1970s, and so it appears a little bit uh, squished, uh, but it's the same price line as in the previous figure. And you see a number of other things added to this figure. In particular, there are these geometric figures, uh, squares and triangles and circles on the graph. Each one of these geometric figures represents a price announcement made in one of the major trade press journals. You see some geometric figures are solid, they're filled in, and some are open. The solid figures indicate that it was a joint price announcement in the sense that first one firm made the price announcement, and then in subsequent issues of the trade press, other firms made exactly the same announcement of a price increase. The open geometric figures are single announcements. They indicate that one firm made an announcement and nobody else followed. No one else made the same announcement of a price increase. You see the shape of the geometric figure, according to the legend on the graph, indicates who the leader was of the price announcement, either who made the single price announcement or who led the joint price announcement, who made the first announcement in the joint price announcement. The other thing on this figure are the vertical bars across the bottom of the graph. These bars are measured on the right-hand axis. They indicate the number of days that the announcement was made prior to the effective date of the price increase. So if, for example, you see a bar that has a height of 14 days, that means an announcement was made and the price increase was to be effective in two weeks. So it had a lead time of two weeks. You also notice that in the 1970s, some of the price announcements had either zero lead time or a negative lead time. So that would indicate that either they made the announcement that the price increase was effective today, or perhaps announced that we increased our price last week. Uh, so just notifying you of a prior price increase. That's the material that's displayed on this graph. Now let's take a look at it. What do you see in this graph? What are the dominant patterns in this graph? The key thing that shows up to my eye is the distinct difference between behavior before 1985 and after 1985. After 1985, you see regular price increases, regular ascent of the price, uh, you see mainly joint price announcements, you see a rotation in the identity of the leaders of the price announcements, and you see significant lead times prior to the effective date uh, of the price increase. When you look prior to 1985, you see a more irregular pattern in terms of the timing of the price announcements, primarily single announcements, and primarily just made by one firm, the market leader, Hoffman LaRoche, and not followed by anyone. The interesting thing about looking about at this graph is that the firms only pled guilty to conspiracy for the period starting in 1990, not this period between 1985 and 1990. So what do you think? Do you think the conspiracy began in 1985, or do you think it began in 1990? As you can see, the firms in the Vitamins Cartel were willing to go to great lengths to achieve collusive price increases, carefully orchestrated price increases. And that's a concern to anyone who's buying a product, one of these vitamin products or any of the other products uh, mentioned in the European Commission decisions that's subject to collusive behavior. I hope you've enjoyed this brief discussion of the economics of collusion. In the follow-up session, we will discuss some things that you can do as a buyer to reduce the risk that you are paying too much for inputs as a result of collusion among your input suppliers. I look forward to talking with you then.